Well, welcome. I'm Brad Krieger. I'm with Arvest Bank, and uh, I'm also vice chairman of the uh, military and aerospace for the Great Air Oklahoma City Chamber. Uh, the chamber has these Friday forums periodically uh, so that, you know, the members of the chamber have an opportunity to see uh, what the current issues and, and some of the things that are going on in our region. Uh, certainly, Oklahoma City's airports, uh, particularly Will Rogers, uh, are critical as gateways and catalysts for development and economic development in this particular region. Uh, today, we're going to uh, learn about what work is in prog progress, uh, the new consolidated rental facility, development plans for the land east of the runways and uh, west of Interstate I-34, I or I-44, and the continued efforts to go ahead and expand and improve service here in Oklahoma City, and uh, again, to enhance economic development. Uh, first, I'd like to take a, uh, a moment to recognize today's uh, series signature sponsor, and that's Cox, Cox Business. And with that, I'd like to introduce Kristen Peck, Vice President of Government and Public Affairs. And Kristen, if you'd like to make a couple of comments. Good morning, and thank you all for coming today. Cox Business is a very proud sponsor of this Friday Forum, but also a very proud uh, partner with the Oklahoma City Chamber. There's an awful lot of work that goes into making our business climate successful in Oklahoma, and what the Chamber does for everybody in this room and for new businesses looking to come in and find a, a place that, that has a great business climate is critical for all of us. So thank you to the Oklahoma City Chamber for everything that you do. So I'm kind of giddy because I love to travel. I am a travel nut. And so I consider these guys rock stars. I'm really looking forward to hearing about what's happening at our airports, what's going on. And I thought, you know, since I have a captive audience, I take a minute to say that my experience at Will Rogers is always very good. There's just a couple of tweaks that could be made. And so I thought I'd throw out my suggestions. First of all, we need a Starbucks, preferably near the Delta counter, if that would work. Secondly, a direct flight to DC would be very helpful to me personally. Um, and then third, if you could please just in <laughs> two, that'd be great. <laughs> so the other piece is the Wi-Fi. If we could have Wi-Fi on mandate that these airlines have Wi-Fi on every single flight that comes in and out of Oklahoma City, perfect, perfect. Now, seriously, though, you guys do a great job. I am looking forward to hearing about what's going on. And I can tell you personally that my experience is always very seamless, great customer service, and I even find a parking space when the parking garage is under construction. So thank you for what you do, and we're looking forward to hearing what you say. Have to say. Thank you, Kristen, and, and thank you to, to uh, Cox Business. Um, I would like to echo uh, Kristen's comment. You know, most everybody here goes in and out of the airport from time to time. I was talking to Rick Johnson with Short, Frankfurt Short and Brusa, and we all commented that it is so nice to come back here. The airport is easy to, to navigate uh, as opposed to some of those airports in Atlanta and Chicago and L.A., et cetera. I mean, we are very, very fortunate, and uh, it is something that we can, uh, you know, certainly uh, relish. With that, um, let me go ahead and uh, of course, Cox is the signature sponsor, and then our host sponsor is the Renaissance Oklahoma City Convention Center Hotel and Spa, and our series corporate sponsors are Central Liquor Company and Guernsey, and so if you'd like to give all them a, a round of applause. With that, we'll take a break, uh, enjoy your lunch, and then we'll go ahead and get started at about just a little bit after 12, and uh, uh, for the reason that you're here, listen to our, our team of speakers. So, thank you. The first one is Mark Cranenberg. 
and Mark's the director of the uh, City of Oklahoma City Airports Department. He began his civilian career as an, in aviation as an airport operations officer at Will Rogers in 1993, later served as the general aviation manager in charge of operations and maintenance at Wiley Post and Clarence E. Page. He holds a degree in aviation management and is an accredited member of the American Association of Airport Executives. Mark also served as an air traffic controller in the United States Air Force and the Federal Aviation Administration. Our next speaker is Scott Keith. Scott is the assistant director of the airports for the city of Oklahoma City's three airports, Will Rogers, Wiley Post, and Clarence Page. Prior to, become, prior to becoming the assistant director, he served seven years as the general aviation manager overseeing daily management of Wiley Post and Clarence, Clarence Page. Scott holds a bachelor of science degree in aviation management and a master's of aviation and space administration from Oklahoma State University. He currently serves as a director of Oklahoma's uh, director for the South Central Chapter of American Association of Airport Executives. Our next speaker, Karen Carney, has worked in public information and marketing manager for Oklahoma City Department of Airports for 15 years. Karen handles the marketing for, the, for all three airports as well as all service development advertising and public relations. She also handles media relations and acts as the department's spokesperson. From, from 2006 to 2010, Karen took a short break from the airport and worked as a marketing manager for Hangar Prosthetics and Orth Orthotics and Science Museum of Oklahoma, but missed the dynamic environment of the airports and returned in November of 2009. Our last speaker has 15 years plus of experience in various airline and aviation related finance and, and strategy roles, including currently serving as vice president of air service development for the InterVistas Consulting Group. And he's also a good friend of Brian Gonnerman's, which I found out. <laughs> I'm sure they both have pictures and, and I'm, I'm searching for those right now. Yeah. Uh, Chris Warren began his aviation career at American Airlines in 1994, where he worked in various finance, marketing, and planning functions. Following a, a stint in the finance group of Transworld Airlines, some of you young people don't understand, Transworld Airlines used to be around a long time ago, kind of brand off Transworld Airlines, etc. cetera. Uh, Chris spent more than seven years at ExpressJet Airlines. He spent most of uh, his time at ExpressJet as the Senior Director of Strategic Planning, where he led the uh, planning process for the carrier's 42 aircraft uh, line of business startup, which served Oklahoma City. Anyway, we will we'll work this as just a, uh, a panel presentation, and uh, uh, we'll start. Mark, we'll go ahead and start with you. Um, we've been hearing an awful lot about the effects of sequestration <clears throat> on airports and air travel. What do you think the impact uh, will be on our airports and air travel? So you're going to get my blood boiling early then, right? <laughs> well, ours is too. Uh, I'd be happy to answer that. First, I just want to say how delighted I am that uh, the Chambers invited me and my team here today. We love talking about airports, so uh, this is exactly where we want to be. Uh, sequester has been interesting. It's taken a lot of my time the last three months. As you know, sequester is federal agencies taking mandatory cuts uh, across the government spectrum. And while there are agencies out there that are doing that probably quietly, there is one agency that's been in the public the last three months quite a bit, and many of you are aware of the issues. Uh, in late February, the Department of Transportation 
announced several cuts to airports that would affect airports in a dramatic way and also passengers. They were mainly three. One was the air traffic controller furloughs, which I'm sure you've heard about. The other was closing midnight shifts at 60 medium hub airports across the country, of which Will Rogers World Airport was one. And then the last one, which was significant, was the closure of the federal contract towers. There's 251 in the country. Eventually, it got culled down to 149, of which one affected our own Wiley Post Airport. Uh, these were very serious concerns to us, and luckily through the, uh, the, the, the legislation that was passed uh, about three weeks ago, it gave the FAA the flexibility and the authority to have an extra $253 million in order to eliminate these cuts. So very slowly, the controller furlough issue was resolved and as well as all of the other 47,000 Department of Transportation employees. It's interesting that controllers had never been grouped into that category before. They'd always been deemed essential. So this was, this was sort of a demarcation, a, a new benchmark for the FAA to do that. Uh, they restored the night shifts, which we were happy about because we had already been working with local air traffic management on the impacts that was going to be severe to us. But the control tower issue was really troubling for us at Wiley Post and, and probably for many of you. Uh, the contract towers basically are contracted out to federal or to uh, private companies for air traffic control services at these towers. And for Wiley Post to uh, not have a control tower actually had a fairly dramatic impact on Will Rogers. Who's a pilot in here? Anybody? Okay, you know if you don't cancel your IFR flight plan when you go into Wiley Post, Will Rogers controllers have to protect that airspace, and now all of a sudden you've reduced capacity or, some, or, or restricted arrivals into Will Rogers. We didn't want to have that happen. And there were other uh, examples of that as well. I want to give a big shout out to the entire Oklahoma congressional delegation. I saw Todd Pauly here with Congressman Lankford's office, and I want to publicly thank him and, and all the other uh, delegation. This ship, I don't think, would have been turned around had it not been for the 41 senators, the 83 House members that signed a letter to Secretary LaHood and also Administrator uh, uh, Huerta uh, urging them to uh, eliminate or take these cuts off of the table. There was also another letter that went out to those gentlemen uh, that was signed by 70 mayors across the country, including our own Mayor Cornette. That was huge. There was probably not a, a House or a Senate member that was not affected in their district and certainly in their state by these cuts. So uh, I just have to emphasize that this was only restored for f uh, fiscal year 13, which ends September 30th. We right now are starting to talk about how can we ensure that this funding will be in place for fiscal year 2014, which starts October the 1st. So I will be talking to Todd and others in our congressional delegation about that. I want to talk about Transportation Security Administration very briefly. Not near as public as the FAA cuts, but what we're hearing now is that TSA wants to eliminate staffing the exit lanes that are co-located with our security checkpoints. So what that means is the airport will have the burden of trying to staff that and also to pay for that security. So what is the lesson of sequestration for me as an airport and for you down the road is it, it appears to be the federal government taking some services that have always traditionally been inherently governmental, U.S. governmental provided, air traffic control, homeland security, and pushing that local control and that local funding onto uh, communities and local governments. And, and that's, that's probably what I think is probably the most ineffective way to create budget cuts. But we need to keep our eye on the ball. Uh, the other part, very quickly, the airport improvement program, which funds airports with construction projects across the country, the other first thing that ever happened was the $253 million that was taken. It was taken from the AIP program to restore these programs. That had never been done before. That's going to hurt projects as far as construction. Okay. Uh, one other question. The east side of the airport has been designated as a development area and stuff. Could you just give us just a brief update on, on how that's going to be handled? Sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, if any of you att uh, attended the Mayor's Roundtable, I participated in one of the lightning rounds where we talked about the uh, east side development. <clears throat> and now we've rolled that out to, we got, we got tired of calling it east side development. So it's actually got a name called Area Landing. And, and we settled on that because we wanted to 
not call it Will Rogers World Airport Industrial Park or Business Center, but we, we wanted something to uh, keep our ties to our namesake, but sake, sake, but also talk about uh, uh, enhance our, our national reputation as a center for aviation and also uh, increase our uh, stability in the region and the airport as being very viable for business. Uh, I've got a couple of slides, if you don't mind. Uh, Karen, if you'll advance those for me. Because <clears throat> I anticipated this coming up. Um, it's a mixed use plan. In other words, what we're doing after three years of planning is now starting to build the infrastructure to go forward with not just aviation development, but also non-aviation or non-aeronautical development. And you know what? We're also going to do retail. Now the FAA, which regulates the uses of airport property, up until just a few years did not allow us to do non-aeronautical. So a couple of years ago when we went to the FAA, we said, we want the moon. And you know what? They gave it to us. They said, okay, here's a few restrictions and some covenants and obligations. You just got to do it right according to our, our rules. But otherwise, you're good to go. And we've got a great relationship with the FAA. So what you see here is about 1,000 acres. And I have to tell you, to have 1,000 acres of mostly greenfield undeveloped property next to a major interstate on a major commercial hub airport is very rare in this country. So it's an absolute great opportunity for us. And we are open for business today. I mean, the first tenant over there was obviously Air Inc. And then we have the Atlantic fixed base operator, which is a fuel provider, which is a huge anchor tenant now that can boost any activity on the east side. <coughs> so what's happened now? You see that red line, that's the realignment of Portland Avenue. So we're taking the existing Portland on the east side of the airport. We're doing away with most of that because we want to expand the aviation infrastructure to go across Portland so we can have bigger parcels and bigger development for our core aviation business. But also you see uh, some other classifications that are going to be there for non-aeronautical and also retail. One of the biggest things that we did in January was we did advanced planning, urban planning, for, for a charrette process. And Karen, I think we have it there. You, you may have seen this as the round table. The signature part of this development is going to be the new intersection at Southwest 74th Street and Portland Avenue. We have a great roadway that's going to be constructed uh, very soon in the fall. The bids have, have already come in. The utilities department already put in a 48 inch water line in the right of way. And uh, the city will start construction on that project again in the fall. It is anticipated to be complete in the spring of 2015. So the city will take a few months to do the south portion from 74th south to 104th and the airport trust is picking up the other portion going north to a, uh, southwest 54th street. That will be a spine road that will be a, a, a new through street to replace the, th the through street Portland that we have today. It will be four lane in, in many areas. It will have medians, it will have landscaping, it will have Esplanade lighting. And at the 74th and Portland intersection, we're planning a retail village or a town center, which will be mixed use. It'll have retail, it'll have office campus uh, potential. It can have entertainment venues. It can have other commercial and industrial uses. It can have gathering spaces and public places. So we're really wanting this to be a sense of place, a sense of business for the airport. So it'll be create great synergy with the City of Oklahoma City's Envision 240 project. And we're very excited about rolling this out now. It's kind of been under the radar. And so the Mayor's Roundtable and this forum kind of gets it out there. It's been in the paper several times, but we're really, really eager to, uh, to, to move forward with the planning and, and get that Portland roadway in. When that happens, you're gonna see, I think, activity really jump out there. And we've got the land development strategy in place, the leasing standards in place, we're ready to lease to aviation or non-aeronautical and even retail. And we'll do the bigger developments through public-private partnerships or master developer concepts, and we've got methods and procedures to do that too. So very, very exciting is one of our projects at the airport that, that typically you don't see airports do. It's a great line That's of business right. for us. That's right. Mark, thank you. Uh, Scott? Yes, sir. We've got, you know, two general aviation air, airports that, that, that you in, are involved with. I mean. Certainly much of the discussion is about Will, Will Rogers and stuff. Tell us the role that, that uh, uh, Wiley Post and, and Clarence Page pay, play now as, as well as into the future. Sure. Um, you know, I think Oklahoma City is in a great position to be able to attract and support 
uh, every facet of aviation. <coughs> Certainly Will Rogers gets the lion's share of, of recognition and rightfully so. Uh, that's where folks obviously go out and catch the, uh, the airliners or pick the loved ones up. But uh, we've got two wonderful other airports that we operate. Uh, Wiley Post in the northwest part of Oklahoma City, uh, just north of 50th between Rockwell and Council is a very large general aviation airport that actually supports a very large facet of business and corporate aviation. And what most people don't realize is there's 400, almost 400 based aircraft at Wiley Post. And out of those 456 are jets. In fact, uh, in, the, in the state of Oklahoma, Wiley Post has the most base business jets out of any airport in the state. That includes Will Rogers and Tulsa International. So a lot of prominent uh, Oklahoma City companies call Wiley Post home uh, as their uh, destination airport that they utilize when they go to uh, business travel. And we also have a lot of folks that use Wiley Post that come in to do business at, at uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, the facilities are pretty much second to none when it comes to general aviation uh, airport in the state of Oklahoma. In fact, the uh, FAA in 2012 uh, recognized uh, Wiley Post as a, uh, categorized Wiley Post as a national reliever airport there's only 56 of those across the whole United States. So we have one here in our backyard that, uh, that is recognized for its activity levels. It has the air traffic control tower, as Mr. Cranenberg described. Uh, it has a 7,200 foot long runway, is our main runway, but actually has three runways. We've got a parallel at 5,000 feet and a crosswind about 4,500. Uh, just to put that in perspective, the uh, Will Rogers uh, runway is they're one of their longest runways that we have is 9,800. So Wiley Post can attract and accommodate pretty much any business jet that's out there and come and go on a uh, routine basis. We've got about 30 base businesses that are at Wiley Post and about 1,500 uh, employees that are there on the airfield itself. Uh, we've coined the phrase for Wiley Post as a one-stop shop for, uh, for your aircraft. Basically, you can bring your airplane to Wiley Post and leave it and get everything done from from tip to tail to in interior and exterior work. Um, so it has been, re and, and literally a lot of folks across the United States take advantage of that opportunity. We've had all kinds of different clients, uh, uh, MBA teams, et cetera, that will bring their um, business jet in just, just for the work at Wiley. So it's a very vibrant uh, airport in that regard. The other thing about Wiley Post is in the last 10 years, um, between the Airport Trust, the Federal Aviation Administration, the state of Oklahoma and uh, private development through tenants, there's been about $28 million invested in infrastructure in that facility alone. Now this example of those investments would be uh, improvements to the runway, uh, taxiways, airfield lighting, taxiway lighting, and actual construction of new facilities that have been um, put up by tenants out there for their hangar or their corporate business uh, departments. We just recently, as the Airport Trust, finished a uh, approximately 20-acre development on the northeast side that uh, basically we, we set it up similar to a housing development in that we went in and put the infrastructure in and the sewer, the water lines, the electric, the uh, streets, and taxiway access. So it gave us an opportunity to be ready if, if somebody wanted to knock on our door and bring their flight department in or they needed to, to accommodate a new jet or aircraft. So they basically just lease a piece of ground from us um, and they're right there. Don't, they don't have to worry about the connections into the utilities or bringing them to the site because they're already there available for them to uh, do their development. Um, the other thing about uh, Wiley Post is about 1,200 acres. So we've still got some area uh, developable on the west side uh, next to council, although the utilities aren't there and we're focusing mostly on the northeast side where we've put that uh, investment in. The other airport that you may not be familiar with that we operate also is Clarence e. Page, which is out on the, the west side of Oklahoma City, uh, off of I-40 and Cimarron Road, if you ever cross that way. Look, look, if you're going west, look to your left and you'll see a little airfield out there. Um, but it's not that small in that it has a 6,000 foot runway and it's got another smaller runway about 3,500 uh, feet. We have about 80 based uh, aircraft at Clarence e. Page. And it is a, uh, mostly a, a recreational grassroots uh, airport. So we're able to accommodate that, that facet of aviation. 
Um, somebody has a, mostly a single engine or small twin engine aircraft that, that call Clarence e. Page home. We have the opportunity similar to what we've done at, at the northeast side of Wiley Post in that we have taxiways and access and electrical hookups where somebody can come in and build their own hangar and to house their aircraft. There's four uh, businesses out there that do specialized aircraft maintenance and so Clarence E. Page is, is in, a, in a position to allow folks that want to come in and out and do business on the west side of Oklahoma City to have an airport that they can utilize and quite frequently we have business jets that go in and out for uh, livestock on the west side or some other things that may be going on there so they're utilizing Clarence e. Page. But the bottom line uh, is that we have three wonderful airports that I think the citizens of Oklahoma City and the state of Oklahoma can take great pride in. One of the things is, is we go around airports and stuff, we're seeing the rental car facilities being off-site and, and consolidated, et cetera. Uh, we're looking at that right now with in, along Meridian. Uh, if you would talk about that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the consolidated rental car facility uh, has been in the design stages for a couple of years now and I think it's a, a terrific project that will enhance Will Rogers uh, on a couple of fronts. Um, but the way it came about was we looked at a, a market analysis that indicated to us that uh, we in the current configuration, um, the way the rental cars were set up because of the constraints of the parking garages, we were, we were not able to really uh, expand or meet the potential of the convention center business that we believe it will bring with the new convention center downtown. So we were proactive in trying to get out in front of that uh, potential business that we think is going to be an increase for us at the airport and decided that we needed to find a location for the consolidated rental car facility. The market currently um, calls for upwards of 600 ready return cars in our current configuration we're really only going to be able to accommodate about 450 because of the constraints of the parking garages and the terminal complex. So we set out to find a suitable location that would be close enough to allow us uh, easy access in and out and we've actually uh, located a, a spot across from the Southwest Reservation Center uh, on the west side of Meridian Avenue and it's about a 40 acre track and the way that's going to work is a passenger will fly in. I'm sure most of you've uh, visited consolidated rental car facilities in other cities but the way we've got it set up here is that you'll basically bypass the ticket counters or the, the uh, agency counters that are in the baggage claim because all of those will move out to the uh, consolidated rental car facility as one complex. So every facet of the rental car program will be located on that complex. The, the rental cars themselves will be there, the customer service building will be there, the maintenance wash bays and the uh, fueling facilities will also be located on this complex. So it really allows the rental car companies to have less movement of cars and actually be able to focus a little, probably a little stronger on customer service. So we feel like it's a customer service enhancement for those folks that are visiting our city. So we'll have a, uh, a four minute bus ride from our terminal. You'll catch that bus on the transportation plaza. And our goal is to have very minimal wait time for our, for our customers. We're gonna have a bump and go type of operation. So the four minute ride out to the facility, uh, go to the, to, the rental, to the rental car counter, and then do your business, walk right out, get in your car, and you're on your way. And the return is going to be a lot uh, more intuitive than it is today because today people that visit our city have to go through the parking garages and also with the same area that you have public parking. So it'll be a little more intuitive, it'll be a little easier to get in, jump on the bus, get back to the terminal and go catch your flight. Uh, it will also aid the airport in the long run in that we're going to open up 450 public parking spaces. So that's a benefit that we see for the airport because we'll be able to capture those for public parking again. The, the facility itself, um, I think we've got a slide of that. Oh, you get a preview of everything. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a 40 acre site and um, it is, it's going to be um, 
financed by the rental car program itself, the, uh, by, by bonds that are backed by the rental car program itself, and also through rental car user fees at about a $40 million uh, cost. And that's going to be the entire complex, the pavement, the facilities itself, all the buildings, and all the infrastructure that's gonna be needed to be done on that greenfield area there. And it'll also be uh, uh, eight buses that will be acquired in that uh, 40 million as well. So we anticipate this to be a uh, wonderful project that we're excited to bring to the city, and we expect it to be completed in the first quarter of uh, 2015. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Karen, there's a number of major projects that, that you're looking at for Will Rogers in this next year. Do you want to go over some of those? Sure. I, one thing at the airports, we're never at a lack for a construction project. Uh, in 2014, the Oklahoma City Airport Trust has just under $65 million worth of capital improvement projects planned for all three airports and the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center, which if many of you don't know, is, uh, happens to be one of our largest tenants. They lease over two and a half million square feet from us, so uh, we always have several projects for Mike Monroney. Lots of them range from airfield enhancements to roof replacements, uh, a lot of not very sexy projects, but they're important and we're excited about them. So you're really interested in what's going on at Will Rogers World Airport because we, we have several projects that we think will ultimately really enhance the customer experience. Probably the largest uh, project is our uh, centralized baggage inspection system. This is going to be something that's kind of behind the scenes but ultimately will improve the efficiency and the security of your checked baggage. Right now, the way the system is, each airline has their own um, explosive detection machine, which is about the size of a minivan, located in the bag makeup area, and all of the bags from a certain airline go through that one machine. Well, it, it, it may seem kind of like optimal, but how, uh, however, um, it's not a very efficient use of personnel not to mention that when a machine goes down, it leaves the airline scrambling to try to figure out how to get the bag screened and get them on the aircraft in a, in a timely manner. So this new system will basically be a centralized area where all the bags from the ticket counter will be conveyed to the central area. Uh, they, they will be screened and then conveyed back to the respective airlines. So it will become more efficient. There's redundancy built into the system, so if something goes down, the bags are ensured to get screened and get on the aircraft in a timely manner. This is a $27 million project. We anticipate it uh, kicking off in the fall. Again, it's a little behind, mostly behind the scenes project, so I don't think that the customer will be too inconvenienced. However, there may be some times when uh, we're working on a certain carrier's area where they may, when you're checking your, their, your bag, they may have to actually physically transport it to another area to get it screened. But it really should be minimal to, to, the, to the traveling public. Um, oh, somebody got that. That kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like, the screening area. Uh, another big project uh, is, it, as Mark talked about, the expansion project was actually completed and the first phase was in 2004, so, so we're already starting to see some wear and tear in the terminal. So all of the backs and the seats to all the terminal seating is being replaced, as well as all of the carpet throughout the terminal building. The seating project has actually already gotten underway. We're about 50% uh, through with that. And in this part of the project, we're adding 170 power units to many of the seating um, uh, four, four plexes, I guess, I'm not sure what the official term is for that, to uh, obviously provide some additional power for our customers in the concourse area. The, that, uh, the carpet will probably begin replacement in September or October. Another big project that we have coming up is uh, our tunnel enhancement project. As many of you, I know many of you use our garages to, to park at the airport and, and you know from walking to the building that there's a lots of wall space and there's lots of empty wall space. In fact, it's over an eighth of a mile. And so we wanted to do some things that would improve the aesthetics of this space. Also kind of address some wayfinding challenges that we have in the tunnel, even though we're, we actually have another project next year where we're actually doing an, a signage study for the entire terminal area 
and roadways. Uh, but we wanted to, to address immediately some of the wayfinding in the tunnel. And we, we figured one of the ways that we could kind of start doing this is by looking at the lighting. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, working to maybe put LED lighting in there. And then as you approach the uh, terminal itself at that end, kind of have a showcase, showcase piece that will keep people talking and, and hopefully get people excited to well, maybe not get excited to go through the tunnel, but at least have a better experience going through the tunnel. Um, and I think then Mark and Scott addressed two of our other big projects coming up. Um, Mark had addressed the sequestration and just some of the changes that people are, are having to go through uh, this year. What are some of the other things that, that travelers are going to experience that may be different from last summer? Well, certainly we're entering our busy season, uh, summer season, and we do see immediately a change in the complexion of the traveler going from business traveler to leisure traveler. So with that comes a whole different way of traveling. Business travelers obviously like bang, bang, bang. Um, and when you've got your family or group, it, 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 the dynamics change a little bit. Last summer, one of, I think one of the biggest things that, that uh, travelers are going to see is that we've improved the flow at the, at the checkpoints. Last summer, we had several times where we, uh, we had wait times at the checkpoints that were an hour or even more. And this was, we felt was excessive and unacceptable. So the airport uh, worked with the Transportation Security Administration to see what kinds of things could we do to improve this and not have that again this summer. One of the things we were able to do is find a location for what we're calling an auxiliary checkpoint lane. Uh, as many of you know, if you fly out early in the morning, that's really our busy busiest time of the day. We have 17, 19 departures going out in an hour and a half, so it's always going to be busy. Plus, you have all those 19 flight crews coming through, all the employees trying to get through, so it becomes very, very congested. So this auxiliary checkpoint lane will allow the flight crews and employees to kind of not, you know, be able to get through separately. The, the TSA can still use that lane for, uh, you know, the general public, just kind of depending how the flow is going out uh, in the ticket lobby area. We've, uh, TSA is also now, ha also has two, uh, now I'm trying to remember, passenger screening canine teams, and we're lucky to have them here in Oklahoma City and while being another layer of security, their mission is basically to uh, be responsible for all of the terminal building. TSA is now utilizing, during, utilizing the canines during peak times of uh, checkpoint usage to help speed up the process at, by adding another layer of security there. We've also added another uh, priority lane on the east side. Uh, we had some challenges in kind of figuring out how to do it. It's, a, it's an unusual layout over there, but we do have now a priority lane on both checkpoints. So uh, d TSA kind of determines which checkpoints are open. That's not an airport call, but d there will be a lane on each checkpoint. Um, and I'd just like to remind people that, you know, it's always going to be busy in that early morning time. So even though we think that the wait times will be significantly reduced this summer, there still could be some busy times. Another thing, just to remind people that um, um, the airlines are kind of changing some of their processes. Um, this is particularly important for families traveling, that where they're actually now closing check-in times 25 to 30 minutes prior to the plane departure. So that means you, not, not, that's online and at the ticket counter. So if you don't have your boarding pass, uh, at that time, you may not be able to get on the plane. So this varies between airline. That's what the challenging part of it is. So be sure to check with that airline that you're flying on to make sure you have your boarding pass in, in plenty of time. And I think one of the last things I want to remind people at the checkpoint, uh, I think everybody knows all this stuff about carry-ons, but TSA, not only in Oklahoma City, but across the country has, been, has seen a significant increase of people trying to carry guns, loaded guns, through the checkpoint. And I like to remind people that you cannot take your gun uh, through the checkpoint with your carry-on. You can check it. Yes, I know, lots of disappointment there. Uh, you can check it and, 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 and it can travel that way. And you just need to let the airline know 
prior, you need to declare it because they do have some rules for packing it. Uh, but uh, that's probably one of the biggest messages they asked to pass along. <laughs> Karen, thank you. Uh, Chris Warren is here, uh, actually lives in Southern California, and so he's got a great perspective. Uh, tell us about what the airline climate is nationally and really right. what we can expect. Can we see any changes in service or, or things here in Oklahoma City? Yeah, and first of all, kind of echoing what Mark said, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, um, and secondly, really quickly, we work with airports all over the country, and I can tell you, you guys have a great airport team here, and they're a pleasure to work with, so it's, it's a real asset to the community. Um, Uh-oh, did I go blank? Uh-oh. Oh, now I really got to wing it. Um, for, you know, from a, from a national perspective, as far as kind of the domestic industry, it's a really unique time. Um, this day, hey, oh, thank God. Um, you know, yes, thank goodness. I was about to, I was starting to, my palms were starting to sweat. Um, if you, I, I kind of tend to look at this in essentially two time periods as far as kind of what departure levels have been throughout the country. And, and the first one, let's go back to 2006. Kind of think about what all has happened economically and, and particularly things that would impact airlines from that back to that point. Number one, obviously, you had the recession, whatever you want to call it, the economic downturn. Second of all, and people kind of forget about this because it's been a few years ago now, you know, in 2007, eight ish, we had that huge oil spike where all of a sudden oil hit $150 a barrel for a short period of time. And I can tell you the economics of airlines at that point did not have that as a possible way for you know, at, I remember because I was working for an airline at the time having conversations like this doesn't work mathematically. Um, so we had that as an issue, as well as there's been consolidation, as I'm sure you've seen through the industry. So if you go back to that period from about seven years ago, domestically, departures are actually down more than 15%. And that's a very significant number over a period of time, particularly a seven-year period of time. So domestically, over, the, um, over kind of what I'd call that intermediate period of time, we've seen a pretty big decline. In the short term, to me, which is even more interesting if you go back three years to 2010, which in theory was kind of the base of the economic recovery, oil had stabilized, although at a level that was still painful for the carriers in that $80 to $100 range, we're still down about 4% departure-wise in the U.S. over the last three years. And what, quite frankly, since the airlines deregulated back in the late 70s, this is pretty unprecedented. Um, airline capacity has typically mirrored the economy, where the economy will boom, air service will increase, will regress, everybody will pull air service out, and we've been in this vicious cycle for pretty much 30 or 35 years. So for the first time, really, in this post-deregulation era, airlines are actually keeping some sort of discipline as far as capacity constraint. Great for airline P&Ls not as much for air service. So, um, you know, we, we fully expect that we ca keep talking about quote unquote the dam breaking here over the next, you know, I don't know, 18 months to three years for a number of reasons. Hopefully the economic recovery takes off. Airlines are beginning to kind of re reconfigure their, their fleets, the airplanes they fly that work better with $90 oil. So, um, and this period of consolidation has come to an end just because we've kind of run out of airlines to, to speed date, right? Everybody's kind of paired up at this point. So, um, you know, we do expect over the next couple of three years a little bit more traditional trend as far as national air service, but quite frankly, it's been a really interesting time over the last few years. And then the next slide, um, you know, the good news, I think, for the community here in Oklahoma City is the community, Oklahoma City has actually fared better than all those trends I was just kind of jabbering out. Um, you know, we have seen a decline since 06, but if you notice that 7% number is considerably less than what we talked about in total. Um, you see a big blip there in 07, 08. There were a couple of carriers that were in Express Jet, the carrier I worked for, US Airways. So you saw that peak in 07, 08. Um, but again, Oklahoma City in general has held together reasonably well. Um, particularly when we get into this short-term time horizon kind of post-recovery. You see we're actually up 1% in departures during that time. Um, and that's a real testimony not only to the team here, but also to the strength of the message in the business community here in Oklahoma City. I, I can tell you, you know, going off, offline a little bit, as I see the camera back there, um, you know, we work with a lot of airports, and I can tell you this is, a, this is a, one of the easier messages to sell to airlines, just the strength of the community, the strength of the economy, um, and I think you see that reflected in these numbers. 
Besides uh, filling seats for the airlines, uh, what are the other things that the airlines are really focusing on? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, well, real quick, let me go back to the air service trends and back to the strength of the marketplace. You know, we've, we've talked about how, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of growth in the industry. We've actually had three startup routes here in the last two that have already taken place and one that uh, will take place later this year. Um, United started nonstop service to Cleveland, which we a very few number of uh, non-hub United airports that has service to all kind of eight of their hubs and focus cities now. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, Southwest operated a seasonal trial to Orlando recently for, for three months back at the beginning of the year, and they've just announced service as well to Atlanta. Um, it's going to be branded as AirTran. There may be a little bit of confusion with the branding, but Southwest has purchased AirTran. They're in the middle of integrating. So at some point, that'll be branded as Southwest service as well. So that's all very positive news, um, and again, plays kind of the strength of the community. Um, going to the question about what airlines look for. Yeah, I think this is getting hung a little bit. Um, you know, it's funny about filling seats. It's you see the revenue, and, and while that's a pretty obvious statement, you know, the the revenue equation for an airline is just like it is for any other business. It's units times price. So while I think a lot of people say, "Hey, my flight's full. This airline's got to be making money on this," I, I've always said I, I could fill a, I could start an airline and fill every seat from day one. Just offer three dollar fares to Honolulu, right? The fares are as much as of the mix issue or the revenue equation as traffic is. So that talks a lot to the strength of the business community um, and, and the fare levels and, and kind of the strength of the marketplace and demand that you see here, and that's why it's such a strong message. Um, again, kind of going back to the team, these guys have done a great job of keeping the airport costs at a very reasonable level. Um, you know, particularly when you get into some of the new branded ultra low cost airlines, carriers like Spirit and, and, and Allegiant, one of the first things Topics one through nine, they talk to you about when they when you talk to them about services. What are your costs? What are your costs? What are your costs? Because they you know they come out with thirty nine dollar fares, and again that math doesn't work unless you've got a reasonable cost equation. Um, you know the support from the community stakeholders and corporate stakeholders. There's the obvious piece about obviously the traveling and the revenue that's generated from the community. But there are some subtle things as well. Um, you know, we've obviously had a couple of um, DOT slot applications for DCA service, and we've got great support from the community on that, and that's been greatly appreciated. Um, as well as, you know, when airlines come and talk about a new route, one of the things is, hey, what kind of extraneous stuff can we get from the stakeholders in town? And um, I can tell you that's been a great experience here, and, and that's a pretty big deal as well. And the last thing is, you know, it, a lot of it just depends on the type of airline. I mean, you know, we all think of American and United and, and Delta and, and, you know, the more traditional airlines. But, um, you know, their business models evolve consistently in the airline industry. And like I said, what American's going to be looking for is going to be a lot different from what a Spirit's going to be looking for. So that's something that as we have our conversations, that evolves um, and we just kind of work through those. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got time for a couple of questions, and there are some microphones throughout the, uh, the room here if uh, you have any questions for the panelists. Steve? Steve? Yep, yep. <laughs> She wants to start considering using the high-rise parking garages at the airport for her personal use. She makes me use the remote lots, by the way. But she wants to start using the uh, high-rise lots, so she asked me if there's always plenty of parking available in those, and also about security within those garages for leaving her car there for a week or two weeks at a time. Can you address either of those so I can report back to her on those tonight? Thanks. <laughs> I'd be happy to take a shot at that. Uh, parking has become a huge part of our business and a few years ago we built the second five-story parking garage and of course it's got crossovers from the first five-story and we're measuring right now the capacity of that parking and routinely we're busting 85 percent capacity in there. Oklahoma City for many years wanted more surface parking than garage parking. But over the last few years, it's really been an interest in the garage parking. And so what we've been doing is, uh, for the last two and a half years, is undergone a rehabilitation project in the two-story parking garage, which is the one immediately north of the terminal, and the original five-story. So we've updated all the electrical. These are 18, 1980s vintage garages. And so we've upgraded the electrical. We've upgraded all the lighting to your uh, point on, on security. And we've also uh, enhanced the lots 
and the surface lots to the north of our most recent garage. We've done a lighting project, so that's even brighter out there too. Uh, but the, the electrical, the lighting, and the structural rehabilitation is, is key for us to keep these garages uh, completely safe. And one of the things that's been a challenge for us over the last two and a half years is we've had to take a part of that garage away, about 300 spaces, because when people park at an airport, it's not like downtown where you can close it at night or the guys can work on the weekends to do something. People will come for two weeks, and we sometimes have to wait two weeks to clear some space so that we can get in and work. So, you know, it, it's been a very difficult process. But our commitment was to try to have as much covered parking as possible. And so that's why this project has taken a little bit longer than normal projects would at an airport. I will also tell you that we have plans for a third parking garage. And it looks like that we're, you know, we're, with our capacity at 85% or greater, that we very well uh, could be looking at a third garage, which would have dedicated ramps, not the crossover. Uh, and so pretty soon, you know, you might not be able to see the terminal for a while with all the garages. But we would extend the, the tunnel as well. So for us, as a size airport as we have and the amenity to come uh, to the airport and not be subjected to be in any weather at all, and to get out of your car and take an elevator down to the tunnel and go right into the terminal, that's a great, great amenity for our airport. Okay. You have another question? Yeah, I, hi, I have a question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the development opportunities at Wiley Post. I'll take a shot at that. Um, there, the 20 acres that, that we've slated over there is basically an aviation related development. And so if a company decides to locate a business that is interested in being at Wiley Post, we can do a pretty fast lease uh, on the ground to accommodate their, their needs. The, um, it, right now, we've actually, this airport trust will be our first uh, development in that uh, northeast development area. So we're excited to get them started out there. It'll be a uh, aircraft sales business. It's, it's already located at Wiley Post. They're just building a new facility and relocating to that location. So it's not anybody that's come, come out from another uh, entity or another city. But we're definitely open for business uh, in that area. And if it's aviation related, uh, we can do something pretty quick. OK, one more question. Yes, sir. about how far from Interstate 44 will, or I guess it's Highway 62 that far south, how far east or west of that will Portland Avenue be? I don't know exactly. It'll be four or 500 feet. The intent of the new Portland Avenue is that you can load development from both sides of that. And, and one of the things that we did some, uh, we're doing engineering now on, is through our charrette process that we did in January, we decided that, you know what, we want to have a median and we want to widen Southwest 74th Street between Interstate 44, which will help you all, and also the new Portland. And we're going to take some medians with some landscaping to facilitate better retail or town center development, the mixed use development that I talked about from 74th Street about 1900 feet to the north. So we have already decided that if we're going to make that our gateway to that community, that we want to even further enhance it. So uh, to answer your question, probably four or 500 feet. But for the retail people and for office campuses and things like that, the visibility that you're going to have as a business from the highway is absolutely phenomenal for to, to, to get your brand out there. The amount of traffic, as Jerry knows, going down Interstate 44 in the morning between the Tri-Cities area in Oklahoma City and going home at night is, is just, it's, it's just nonstop. So it's a great opportunity for visibility. Well, I think we would like to thank the members of the panel here for the information, taking the time, and, and certainly want to thank everybody here that uh, uh, took the time and, and provided questions, et cetera. So, and we'll hang out if anybody wants to ask us yeah. some questions. So. You know, we're very fortunate. We've got three very important resources that, that we utilize, and, and uh, you can see that they're very, very proactive, particularly like with the convention center and stuff. Uh, always looking to the future so that uh, it's convenient to you, it's safe to you, and, and we're prepared. Can I make one more comment? 
Sure. We, we love the MAPS 3 Convention Center, and this is why I love it, is because I think we are going to get more non-stops and more rental car activity. That's one reason for us doing the new facility out of that convention center as we get to a higher tier level of convention business. So I think our air service is going to increase. So everything we do at the airport is leaning forward, watching everything else that's going on in the city, the city's uh, other projects, and also what's going on in the community. It's the bioscience sector that got us San Francisco. It's what's going on in the community. So when we take Chris on our road show to visit people, uh, other airlines, uh, it, half of our presentation is about the airport, low cost, et cetera, stuff that they like. But they really want to know what's going on in the community, and that's where you can help us a great deal. Yeah, and I can't stress it. Um, I can't stress enough how, how positive on a relative basis to a lot of the conversations we have, the Oklahoma City conversations are. I think the air, you know, there's this kind of cadence that, w the, that we talk to airlines with through the industry and you know, we've been promoting this message and everybody kind of nods up and down like that's right, Oklahoma City, and we get a lot of positive response from airlines. So we're continuing to push that message and to Mark's point, um, you know, I, I think we all think good things are coming. Well, let's give applause to our panelists. And again, we would like to thank uh, Cox Business for uh, being the signature sponsor for this today. And, and uh, June 28th is the next date that we will have a Friday forum, and it's going to be the Building America's Future. Ed Rendell will be here to talk about, uh, along with a panel, the importance of investing in transportation to ensure economic competitiveness, uh, transportation, infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, it's, You've got to do it. So anyway, thank you for being here today. And with that, we're dismissed. I don't think I've ever been a rock star before. Thank you.